Okay, I'm going Hi. to call the finance committee meeting of the um, to order on May 16th at 5:30, and uh, this is a uh, meeting that is uh, being held uh, by Zoom in consistent with the amendment to the open meeting law. Members of the public have access to the meeting also via Zoom as well as by telephone. Um, everybody should be aware that the meeting is being recorded. I want to go through first with the committee members to make sure that everybody present uh, can hear me and be heard. And then uh, we'll check on other counselors and see if we have a yeah, you'll have to decide, Lynn, if you have a quorum of the council and need to call a council meeting. Uh, so going through the uh, committee, Anna Devlin Gauthier. Present. Uh, Lynn Griesmer. Present. Bob Hegner. Present. Matt Holloway. Present, thank you. Uh, Bernie Kubiak. Present. Kathy Shane. Here. And welcome back. And uh, Alicia Walker. Here. So we have all members and I'm present. So we have all members of the committee present. Um, you we do not have a quorum of the council at this point. Pat has joined us, but we only have six counselors. So keep an eye out. And if we get to a quorum, Pat, can you hear? Yes, I can, Andy. Thank and you. Guilford, you're the other one I wanted to check on. Um, Hi. Um, is there anyone else? Is, is Amy or anyone else coming today? No. Okay. So um, let me just uh, review agenda for a minute, um, which is uh, uh, part of the first item on the agenda, which is called order and review agenda. And then I'm going to see if there's any public comment um, as the next step. But uh, Guilford, there's, um, well, this is uh, a meeting all about you uh, because it's a uh, DPW operating budget uh, and enterprise fund. There's actually other parts that we reserved because there were some questions that came up when we were reviewing the capital improvement program um, regarding uh, issues that uh, were purchases and other capital requests from uh, DPW. And uh, rather than uh, hold it off because we don't really have to make, have to make a recommendation or schedule a separate meeting. Uh, we just thought we'd come back to that today. And the same thing happened with uh, water and sewer rates. Uh, we did have a discussion on water and sewer rates with Sean on May 5 and decided also to uh, hold the vote on the order until after we had the presentation of the enterprise funds because the enterprise fund budget ties in totally with the water and sewer rates since it's the major revenue source. So um, there may be questions that come out of the rate memo also. And uh, we have scheduled, just so you know, um, you do not have to attend, but our next meeting on Friday, then consideration of approval order 2410. Um, which is the approval order uh, for the water and sewer rates and to make a recommendation on that. So that um, gives an overview of the sections that we're going to talk about. So it's um, DPW operating budget, um, the enterprise funds, um, questions about the um, capital requests and or um, Sean has, uh, I think, all has questions, and uh, I don't know if he's had a chance to go over with them with you or not. Uh, and uh, the rates issue. 
So uh, with that said, uh, we do always start the meeting by seeing if there's any members of the public who wish to offer comment and um, comment can be on any matter of relevance to the finance committee. It does not have to be restricted to the issues that are on the agenda of the day. So um, if uh, public, any member of the public wishes to offer public comment, please raise your hand so that we can bring you into the room. Okay, seeing none, uh, then I think that we should just go on to the um, order of the day. And Sean, did you have anything that you wanted to say in, at the beginning, or do you want to go into pre prepared questions to start? How do you? Um, I was thinking since this is all, um, Guilford will handle his operating budget, water, sewer, solid waste. I'll probably take transportation just to give Guilford a break, um, but he, he'll stick around for that because there's some things that um, cross over. Um, Guilford, I don't know, typically what we do is a kind of a short overview of each section and then we can dive into the question. So Guilford, do you want to give a, start with a quick overview of maybe the DPW operating budget and the different divisions and um, maybe some of the projects that are coming up? Um, actually, my uh, my allergies are really acting up, so I'm only just jumping to questions. Sounds good. Um, <laughs> so I posted the list of questions in the packet, um, and I don't know if it's helpful if I just uh, put them up on the screen with the responses, or um, if you want to go through them, Guilford, whatever's given your allergies, whatever's most helpful to you. So do you want to start with, you don't want to do the capital improvement. Uh, we could start with those questions, some some of the carryover questions. So one of the carryover questions was about the um, trash truck and how the trash truck sort of came to be a priority because it wasn't in the initial capital improvement program that went through JCPC, but it was in the final version um, that came uh, from Paul. Okay, so um, there's a lot of disconnects in how we run this town government. Um, one is budgeting and purchasing with capital items. I hate to say it, but I'm just going to, I've been here for a while and it's just always a disconnect. Um, we put together, a, we try to put together a budget last year that you'll approve for June or July 1st. Um, and sometimes things come up and things become an issue. Um, the biggest issue we're seeing in equipment purchases right now is it's taking anywhere from 18 or 12 months to 18 months to get a piece of equipment. So we put in the request last year for two trucks in parks, tree and ground. And as we were getting to the point of getting ready to order them, we had been having troubles, trouble with one of our other trucks, which is actually the trash truck. Um, and we could actually move move it around if we wanted to, but then the crew brought up the issues of it's a hard truck to use for some of the members because you have to lift the the containers up into the truck. Um, I, if you if I want, I can show you a picture of what we're using and what we're talking and what we're hoping to get. But um, can we share that with you? Yeah, well, I think it's helpful um, to see what people have to do to get trash into the truck if you have it available. Um, hopefully this works right. Um, so you're seeing the the picture of a of a truck with a person standing holding a trash can right now. Mm -hmm. So this is the truck. It's it's basically a, your basic. It's your basic forty five hundred Chevy. Um, Pick up the dual wheel pickup truck. It can have a trash body on it. We can actually take this body off and change it, but we haven't, we don't do it anymore. Um, so the person who, one of the per people who actually do do the trash, does the trash most of the days is this young lady here who's lifting the trash can up in. Um, and it can be, it can be a hassle and it can be a problem. So the crew was pointing out that if we were to replace this truck, we should probably go with more of a traditional style of trash truck instead of what we're using. Um, so this is the, the vehicle we're looking at now. It doesn't require a commercial driver's license to drive. It requires a regular class D license and it's a four yard 
four four yard truck um, holds four yards of uh, waste in it, um, and it's easier to load because you load it from the back. It's a back as a rear load truck. Um, <clears throat> one of the other issues that was brought this to the forefront is um, COVID actually has made our parks very popular, and we have not seen the popularity diminish. So there's a great deal of trash which is generated at the parks that have to be picked up every day. Um, so this is a truck that does it and this crew does it. Um, a crew goes around every day, seven days a week in the morning and picks up the trash at downtown, uh, some of the bus stops and all the park areas in town. And this is the truck we use for doing that. Our, this is the truck we use for doing it and we hope to use the other truck. So this is kind of why this came to the forefront. Um, we also, luckily, a vendor was like saying, I have a bunch of these trucks that I've ordered and I'm looking for people to buy them. So we actually had the ability to jump on our order quickly. Um, the trucks are not here yet, so we haven't purchased it and we haven't truly committed to buying it, but there is a truck available which is slated to come to us if it's approved. If it's not approved, we he knows we he have to sell it to somebody else. But this is the garbage truck, and if there's any questions, I'll answer that. I'll stop sharing. And and Guilford, this role is the tr is a responsibility of the tree and grounds. It's not a solid waste correct uh, function. It's tree and grounds, which is why we're not. This isn't being proposed from the solid waste enterprise fund, but um, it's really a tree and grounds vehicle. Correct. The tr tree and grounds has always picked up trash. And these, well, they've always done it since I've been here. They did it before I got here. So this is what is part of their duties is picking up trash at the parks and commons. And we've added bus stops in the downtown. Yeah. And so just to round out um, the explanation. So we thought about bringing this as an off cycle request to the town council, but ultimately we decided um, to put it through the capital improvement program. Um, but again, it, it didn't come in the normal uh, sort of flow as capital projects um, in terms of how it was uh, put forward. So that's why it came in after JCPC, um, but before I went to the council. Okay, um, let's keep going and uh, just leave it that anybody um, from the council or the committee who raises a uh, there's a question, just raise your hand so we know and as we're going through items and uh, we're not going to stop and ask your questions every time, but we'll continue to look for um, hands. So the well, Andy, one other question that might be helpful. Um, Guilford, if, if approved, will this free up that other truck to be used for something else? So therefore, you're not adding a vehicle to the fleet, but you're you'll be able to repurpose that and not um, and then therefore not have to replace one. Um, well, actually, what will happen is the truck you saw, which you use now, will be the trade in for the trucks that um, are coming right. for from 23's budget. So, so your that total, truck will go away. Your total number of vehicles will stay the same. Yes. Right. All right. I'll keep going since I, oh, there's a hand. Okay. Bernie. Um, I don't, is it appropriate if I ask Guilford sort of a general question? Yes, um, I, I'm wondering um, what, how many positions you have in your departments vacant right now and how um, recruiting has been going, if the salary amounts are sufficient to attract people in. Um, and we're, we, we, the, your, your department competes a lot with uh, construction companies and uh, it's always a concern of mine that uh, uh, we can't hire people. Um, um, we're down 10%, which is six people. Uh, we're missing three people in the water treatment division. Um, we had a retirement, which caused a promotion. And then we had two employees who resigned to go do something else, something totally different. Um, so we have three vacancies in water treatment. We have two vacancies in the highway division, and we have one vacancy in tree and ground. Um, <clears throat> we are interviewing a lot of people. People will apply. People are asking for the top step of what we advertise. They do not want to start at the bottom. 
we've had people ask for signing signing bonuses and we've had people just flat out say it's not enough and turn us down um a lot of people we've had several people just ghost us after we interview them and talk about salary um amy can uh, amy would go on for an hour or two talking about the great challenges of interviewing right now we have one person we are looking at for the tree and ground position um he he looks like he'll be a good fit um but we'll see how how he responds to the uh, the salary thank you Um, Guilford, do you want to um, address the recreation equipment and um, with the, what I had said last time when the question was posed on whether additional staffing were being added? The answer was no, we're not adding additional staffing and that to use the recreation equipment um, would require trade-offs. Can you address that a little bit more? So yes, um, we broke the request for field maintenance in the three, three parts and one's equipment um, the, the equipment that's in the capital plan is the equipment. Um, there's two, two, actually two sections of that equipment. One section is the largest number is equipment we would definitely need. And then the smaller number for field maintenance and equipment is a, is additional equipment that we could get by if we had to. Um, the second part of that request was for materials, seed, fertilizer, sand, um, material to be used in maintaining the fields. Um, that was left out, left out because we probably aren't going to get all the equipment we need for a year. So we have time to adjust our budget and see what we can free up and adjust a little bit and see what we truly need um, for what we truly need and what we can move around. Um, we're not going to be able to move much around, but it gives us a little time. And this third part of it was a uh, we requested an additional staff member to help with the fields. Um, <clears throat> this is going to the field maintenance that the community has decided on will require additional staff time and labor to do. So it either means we take somebody off of doing another job to do this job or we add an additional staff member. But then <clears throat> we probably won't get all the equipment for a year um, at the rate we're getting equipment when we buy it. Thank you. And some of this connects too with questions that Mandy Joe has asked in the past, which is, are we going to set up a billing arrangement with the regional schools um, to for TBW to basically use this equipment on their fields? They currently they pay, um, they provide some of the supplies. I don't know if they provide all the supplies. Gilford, you probably know better, um, but they provide some of the materials that are used on their fields, um, but they don't cover any of the time um, or labor that's that's used there. So um, that's something that we'll be continuing to look at. Kathy? Yeah, just following up. Thank you, Guilford. Um, as you know, we, we got some of this information when we were doing the capital review. So if um, you don't get the equipment, the new field equipment now, right away, so you don't need the supplies right this coming year or the person, a year from now, and this is, um, I guess I have to look over at Paul, a year from now, are we likely to have the money for the supplies and the person? Um, or do we have a piece of a reasonably expensive equipment that we're not staffed to use or we're, and the supplies, just what we were told, it's, it's you know, the types of plugs you aerate the ground with, it's, it's, uh, it's stuff that goes into the fields to make them healthy and strong. So so that's my general question of, you know, thinking not just this one year, but the equipment now and then later. And my other that I asked during the meeting, and I've just never been sure what might be possible. UMass has a uh, field maintenance training program and design program. And is there any possibility that the town could get in-kind support from UMass for any of this. Either are they already buying a lot of the stuff we would want to put on our fields? Um, so could they buy, I don't know whether it's a ton more or two tons, you know, so it's, you know, just, and then, or do they have staff where they're trying to do train, train people because this is going to be their profession going out 
that could be uh, use our fields as training ground. So that that's that's my. Do we have a way of of getting some synergy out of having this giant university sitting in our midst with with this program that's very specific to this? They they're maintaining fields, um, and I won't look over at Amherst College um, because that seems to be a bigger stretch where um, they also clearly have a lot of fields. So I'll stop. I'll I'll, I'll start with UMass if you want. Um, we do have UMass trained employees in our staff who have worked and gone through the same programs that these people are go through right now. Um, we have reached out to them on multiple times to set up some um, internship programs or summer programs for their staff who are trying to look for jobs to um, work, work experience during the summer and work experience during the year. Um, we find that we cannot compete um, we cannot compete without other people for those people. Um, salary wise are just, um, it's too basic. What we do is very, is a bit basic and some people want to do more. It's not golf course maintenance we do. It's it's just general field maintenance and athletics maintenance. We don't go to a level that an NCA division school would go. So some of these people are looking for those type of thing, uh, those experiences. Uh, there is not that many people out there, so bigger schools and bigger community call, uh, com golf courses and country clubs, they, they usually hire the people away, and the bigger landscape companies usually hire these people for internships and so forth, so we don't have much experience or much luck getting those people to come help with us. During the school year, um, that during your school year, you get this fall and your spring semester, which is they're willing to do theoretical stuff. But then again, putting it into play is is the but then again, our guys know exactly what they're doing in the class because they went through those classes as well. We have two people who went to those classes um, and graduated from the pro different programs there at Stockbridge. So they know. So that's where that is. Um, I don't think we would ever be able to borrow people or equipment from their field maintenance because their field maintenance people are always going and always working so that would be uh that would be we haven't even approached that i mean, think that'd be probably a little too difficult probably i wasn't saying that our staff weren't trained to do it i was looking about getting the extra hands you answered the question thing and then then my question about if if we're getting equipment and it's not going to arrive until maybe the end of this coming year, will we have budget room when we've got it to be able to use it? We kind of have to figure out, yeah, we, we, we have to figure out what we can put off doing and adjust to make this work if there's no more funds coming. Um, but we haven't got there yet, so we're still just trying to figure that out. Yeah, and we are looking at how we manage our fields we utilize our fields for private programs quite a bit um, or for recreational programs um, and there's fees collected and such and so we are reviewing the whole process around field management um, and potentially how some of those funds could be diverted for the materials that need to go back into the fields to keep them in good condition um, there seems to be a logical connection between collecting fees and and putting it back into the fields one additional question along this line, and that is, uh, I keep hearing that around the high school and community fields that the land is particularly wet because of Tan Brook and uh, Willie's efforts in this equipment do anything to take care of that underlying problem. Yes, it will. I mean, deep teat time aeration does a great deal for helping encourage drainage and and uh, root growth in the zone for the grass and everything. So most of the things we'll be doing will help with drainage and will help with that. Um, the actual the two fields at community field, which is a town field, and the fields over on the high school, they actually do have drainage installed underneath them, and they do work pretty well. Um, pictures we took, we had taken with a drone during the 2016 drought, clearly showed all the drain lines and the other drains on those fields. It was really kind of interesting to see that. Um, and they do work, they do work, and then the deep tying aeration would actually encourage that and make it work better. 
Thank you. Sean? Guilford, do you know um, roughly the number of vehicles that EPW um, operates throughout the year between the enterprise funds and the and the general fund? Um, and do you know if, how that compares? Has it changed over over the years? Um, it's, the number of vehicles we have are pretty has been pretty steady. Um, we're around we're between fifty and sixty, and I the numbers change every so often because we get rid of something. Um, but then again, the, the vehicles we operate include loaders. We have two loaders. We have two backhoes. We have some small uh, loaders we use for um, some different things. Uh, our mini excavator, our, our large excavator. So it's not all just vehicles that everyone drives in every day. There's some specialty vehicles in there. There's the sweeper. Um, we talked about the mower already. There's the large mowers for the fields. There's the small mowers for the field. Those are all included in those numbers as well. As well. Okay. Um, have you considered a regional approach to roads, such as a shared crew uh, that could more economically address some of the larger projects? We had a little bit of a conversation at the, during the capital improvement program about, you know, and I think we've talked about this before, would it ever make sense for the town to have its own road crew to try to do more, uh, get, get more accomplished and, and rely less on contractors? And what would be, what would we have to do to make that a reality? There would, there are only three paving or three asphalt plants in the local area. Um, you're kind of watching how stressed one of them gets when they have a lot to work when you're watching Route 9 right now being paved by Mass DOT. And that company is paving Route 9 and is also working for Hadley at the same time right now. And some of the changes we've had to make to the scheduling is because that plant cannot um, wouldn't be able to take on much more than it's already doing. Um, so there is a limitation to what's available in the area. The town would not want to get into the business of running an asphalt plant. So if you wanted to do a regional paving type thing, that's something that possibly could happen. It's been done in other communities outside the state. I don't know of any, any program like that in this state. Um, it does run up against a little bit against um, some of the beliefs of uh, some of the theories and beliefs that uh, New England has about small communities can take care of themselves. I mean, there's no county governments where I've seen it work the most. It's when a county government runs it and the county government would take care of us, several com communities in the county and take do their paving for them. And it's actually where it's actually one of the jobs I started at when I started doing this. Um, but if we wanted to invest in some more equipment, we need to invest in more people. Um, we would have to actually hire people who are qualified to operate the equipment, which we're having a hard time even finding people who could possibly do that at this time. Okay. Um, seeing no hands. I just, I just want to oh, add to that. So when we add staff, we also add health insurance, pension, and all the ancillary costs that go along with it. So these are long-term investments in people if we're gonna maintain staff, and maintain a crew, it's a long-term liability that we're taking on as well. So it's not just the salary equals. Um, and a lot of those costs are built into the contractors when we hire them. Um, and so we can only use utilize these crews if it's a paving crew that you wanna have them uh, develop experience when, and, you know, you can only pave during certain months of the year, and then in the winter we have other. Uh, we'd have to figure out what else they would be doing. So the next question, um, and this may be too early to say, um, but the money that's in this capital plan for roads, Guilford, about two point two million uh, for roads. Do you have any sense of what roads that will cover? No, this yeah. what you're approving this year is for next year's paving plan. So you would not put that list together until at the earliest November, December of this year. Mm -hmm. So we could try to get it bit earlier in the spring and move with that. Okay. Len? Oops, excuse me. Um, since we're on roads, I might as well go ahead and ask my questions, which... Um, is there any benefit to us having a multi-year plan and bidding it at once? 
That's um, um, or is there any benefit to us working collaboratively with other cities and towns and doing the bidding? Working together, I mean, it can be done. I mean, we, we've been doing, we do things for other communities all the time where we bid it and we supervise, help supervise the work. Um, we did the water line at Leverett. We're doing something, we're, we're designing something to possibly do in Hadley and designing something to possibly do in um, Pelham. Um, working collaboratively does work and we can do things like that. We actually put out our bids for paving and meet, we manage them and it works pretty well. Um, if if we wanted to try to do something collaboratively, it's, it's something we could possibly talk to some other communities around us to come in and try. Um, um, <clears throat> but they would have to be willing to do it as well. We have to set up the rules for how it works. Doing a multi- Yeah, go ahead. Do, Doing a multi-year bid for paving, the big paving we do, the maintenance paving, is not um, that advantageous because when we bid, we need to actually uh, list out the roads and list out the work we need to be we need to do. Um, we've added a, we've added one or two roads that we're paving this year because they've just gone they've just gone downhill so fast they weren't on our they weren't on our they weren't on our screen earlier in the year and they wouldn't have made it if we had bid it a three year bid and that those roads wouldn't have been on it so it would, would have been harder to change the road if we had a three-year bid putting a bid out every year and just being pr proactive and getting them out is, is the best way we found for doing that it it does i find it interesting that um i understand that each road has a different estimate on them and so forth but it does seem to me in a multi-year bid there would be some ability to add or subtract a road um, in the pro in in terms of the way the contracts no negotiated. I just it, it's no secret. I'm feel, I'm feeling we have a serious problem on our hands with roads, and I think we need to think extremely creatively on how we can get ahead of this over the next five years. Kilford, if we um... Let's say we had $10 million to bid out for roads and would we be able to get $10 million worth of work done this summer or the following summer? Is there, is, do, you, do you get a sense there's an upper limit on how much work um, a contractor can do for us? I'm just getting back to Lynn's point about a multi-year. The only advantage I might see from that is trying to get ahead of the contractors in terms of their schedules piling up. Like maybe, you know, if we go out three years, we can get more in the queue um, and get Get them to lock it in before other other towns bid on it, or some, some send out their bids. So one of the other issues we run into is um, state work. So right now we, uh, right now, can everybody hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yep. I'm getting messages on my computer about unstable. Okay. Um, right now, we run into the issue. We're running into the issue where the state hasn't bid anything that, right in, recently. Um, they actually have a vacancy in Boston that um, coordinates and pushes out the state workload, and it doesn't. It seems like that's affecting their ability to to bid on time. So we're actually benefiting from that because there's not a lot of work out there. So the contractors are bidding for us. The thing we run into though sometimes is is we'll bid jobs and then the state will start bidding jobs and the contractors will bid the state jobs. The state jobs <laughs> they'll work on more diligently and knowing that we can work around and be a little more open about how things get done, which actually gets our work done usually it gets our work done in the time period we give them. Um, but we have to worry worry about the state taking all the capacity or shortening the capacity. The most we've ever done has been $4 million and we ended up finishing that contract uh, really late. We were paving, I think, after after Thanksgiving, which we don't like. Um, we've actually, we've had a couple of contracts which have gone over into the next year because of that. So it's it's not, it's really, a, there is a capacity issue and the contractors, if they, if the money's there, the contractors will invest, but the contractors just don't see the money to invest to build up the crews and have a bigger workforce in the areas where it's kind of 
the way it's going right now. They think they've optimized it. Uh, but clearly, if you look at the condition of our roads and those of our surrounding communities, there's a lot more work out there. And so there's, how do we incentivize them to, uh, you know, become larger so they can take on more contracts? Now, I know all of this is money and it means making it a priority. It has to be consistent too. It has to be consistent money. A contractor is not going to invest in the equipment and then have a crew that works for two years and then there's no work for that crew and they got all this equipment sitting around they're paying for. So it, it's a multi-year thing. It's, um, it's, it is a big a bigger issue that needs to be looked at. I mean, one of the issues that's hurting us, I believe, is just what we do in the winter. We spend all summer repairing roads or trying to repair roads, and then we spend all winter destroying them with putting down more salt to keep the roads clear so everyone can drive as soon as the snow stops. Um, if we actually changed our theory and how we approach winter maintenance, we might actually see our roads last longer because a lot of the deterioration we've seen, I believe, and many of us believe, comes from the fact we're using more salt than we did in the past. And that's just causing, it keeps the water from freezing, but it allows the water to trickle into the cracks. And when it finally freezes, it pops more than it would normally. If we went back possibly to a sand salt mixture, you'd have less salt, you'd have less water that freezes uh, or less water that can filter in and freeze. So you have less popping. But then again, we're also getting global warming and I can, we, ha we got less than, we got probably less than 12, 12 inches of snow this year in our area. So there's a lot of things that factor into the, into the roads and how long they last and how long they'll, we, we need, or when we need to work on them. It's, it's a lot of things going in and some things we can't control, some we can. And Lynn, to your point earlier, we're spending more on roads, but we're doing less roads in terms of the amount of work yes. um, and yeah. in terms of putting another crew, you know, we're just, everyone's paying more for fewer roads. Um, yeah. That's the, that's one of the struggles. I will just tell you that there is no question about it that when counselors go on the campaign trail this fall, this will be probably the number one item because it's in everybody's backyard. And I again, I just really encourage us to think creatively in every possible way of how to be more aggressive about what we do. Technically their front yard, but front yard, fine. In most in most, in most cases, but yeah. not all. We are we are going to put out our normal crack ceiling bid, which we do every year. We do it for three years. The crack ceiling bid actually has a couple extra treatments on it this year. Um, we're going to try to siphon off a little bit of big paving money and do some more maintenance maintenance treatments. The only thing is, is that like crack sealing maintenance treatments only last at the most five years. So you're really just making a, a patch. Some of our payments aren't lasting more than five years either. So um, it depends on what's going on. Matt. Thanks, Andy and Gilbert. Thank you very much. And I want to just... Um, Echo what you know what Paul said about sort of the um, the investment in staff to operate um, equipment and but I think Sean's point about you know spending more for less on on road contracting is really um, troubling and and so I think you know I'm not sure that region when when the question came forward as as terms of a regional agreement you know I don't know that we were necessarily talking pooled resources as opposed to at least when I mentioned it at our at our previous meeting as opposed to potentially um, contracting out at times. Um, so, you know, and I, I appreciate the philosophical, you know, concern around uh, avoiding county form of government. I, I don't think that was the intent of the question. And um, I just really want to encourage us to, you know, potentially the council could call for um, a study for, for, you know, I think growing in-house talent really does seem to be a, um, a major, concern or, or merit major area of opportunity maybe for this you know I mean we're talking about the shortage of, of labor you know regardless of the available funds um, you know across the, the region 
And, you know, again, to Paul's point that that talent, if we were to, you know, bring in a road crew or, or somebody to oversee the road work specifically, you know, they would have to have four seasons worth of work and that would have to be baked into the um, job description. But I just want to encourage, um, you, you know, all town staff as well as, as counselors to sort of think seriously about if we can move forward with a, a plan to address this systemically rather than, um, you know, uh, through through contractors per job. I love I love Lynn's suggestion of the um, potential multi job bids and such such like that. Anyway, thank you. Kathy. Um, yeah, this I realize I I mentioned UMass a lot um, when I, I talk about these issues, but if we I would bet we have about twenty thousand cars and innumerable large trucks and delivery vans on our streets that we wouldn't have if we didn't have a flagship here. And the state, um, as we know, UMass is not paying into our infrastructure, but somehow making an argument through Mindy and Joe that we need specific allocations um, because of who we are as a town for our roads, um, the wear and tear on our roads, Guilford, you said is the ice and storm, but you know, if you watch what's happening all around here in the north part of town, it's at eight in the morning and at three in the afternoon, it's cars going back and forth, lots of them and big and some major large trucks coming in. And that's, I don't think they're delivering food to black sheep downtown. You know, I mean, it's, it's big equipment. So just it's a wear and tear on our roads that's quite different than um, a small college would generate. So just trying to find a creative way to say our chapter 90 money hasn't gone up at all. I mean, it's this fixed dollar amount, but there should be a special allocation in some way when we are talking to our representatives. And I don't know what we would call it. Um, so, so Kathy, Paul is working on a outline of a uh, re reforms we'd like to see with the state-owned land um, or advocate for with state-owned land um, and one of the arguments in in the document he's working on is around roads and infrastructure and how many more vehicles um, and we did reach out to pvta um, to get some anecdotal data um, we were trying to get traffic counts um, and looking at like when, co when covid was here were the traffic counts significantly lower than pre-covid um, it was helpful, but the data wasn't consistent enough to to really draw any direct conclusion. So this is actually a question for Guilford. Do we have any ability to do sort of car counting or traffic counting ourselves? Um, you know, are there logical access points to the campus where we could get a sense of how many vehicles kind of enter and leave uh, throughout the day? Or would it be expensive to, to commission sort of a study like that? We, ha we have the ability to, if we want to spend some money to actually have continuous counting every day um, at all our traffic signals, and then to set up some remote sampling spots using some of the software that is used to control our traffic signals. Mm -hmm. We would just have to invest in some additional additional software and additional um, <clears throat> support. There would have to be a, a mechanism for actually getting the data back to us. If, if you drive through one of the intersections that does the trick the cameras that actually is controlled by a camera that actually can count cars um it can classify cars and we just have to buy the pieces to tap into that data and then pull it back and you could have you could for us it's probably anywhere from my quarter to a half million dollars to install all this stuff but you could have uh traffic center like you see on movies and stuff where people are watching cars move and so could we do cars. the could we do just like the little strip that goes across the road that hopefully costs a couple hundred dollars click, click, click. Um, <laughs> i mean i like your idea too but the, I'm, I'm just thinking of um that data would be helpful for what paul's working on if we were able to put some some heart uh more concrete numbers in um, around just around how many vehicles sort of cross over you could also ask you mass for um they're, they're, they said they're filling up every spot on their parking lots and ask them for a, car, a count of all those permits that they've got because they empty out at the end of the day. I mean, not some cars are parked overnight, but a lot of them are coming. In. It won't get my truck issue that these big trucks are coming through, mm -hmm. too. 
Kathy, I have those numbers somewhere from when I did the rail um, hearing. Let me just look really quick and I can tell you. So I'm just saying, it, you're right, Sean, it's like piecemeal right now on a few intersections and, you know, some volume. Yep. Yeah, um, I mean, my, uh, this, this might be a, a sarcasm warning. Uh, Amherst isn't unique. It doesn't do us any good if we, we're less than one half of 1% of the state's population. So thinking that we're going to go to our, our rep and senator, no matter how, com how competent they are, and somehow tap into a new flow of money from the Commonwealth is a waste of time. What we need to do is to look at other communities in the state, and there are others that have large state facilities, whether colleges or prisons or something else, that run into these problems and form a larger group and push on it. You know, this, 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 you know, this, this thing that Amherst can do better, I, I, I really appreciate it, but we're part of a large, we're, we're just one small speck in a fairly small commonwealth. Um, and if we form a group, uh, we'll do much better. I mean, as Arlo Guthrie said, you know, if one person does it, it's an accident. If two people do it, it's a coincidence. But if three people do it, it's a movement. We need a movement. Yeah. And there are other towns that are in our, our, our position. The second thing is, is that um, as I came to learn, sometimes painfully, paving a road is a lot more difficult than it seems. Um, there is an asphalt and type of asphalt. There are types of asphalt. And what the asphalt companies are producing may not be what you need at the time you need it because it's a chemistry experiment. Uh, it's oil-based, and so the prices are very volatile. Um, it's the same thing with all the steel um, and, uh, and other components that, uh, that go into uh, uh, putting things in the road. And I understand that people are upset about the street. Um, I frankly like the potholes in front of my house because it slowed everybody down, but you know, Guilford came through and fixed the street. What can I say? Um, so, so, you know, the town does have a, we do have a pavement management plan. It's, uh, um, it might be helpful to, uh, I think, Guilford, I think you've done one or two releases of the findings from the pavement management plan. It might be helpful to share that with the council so they understand how these decisions get made about, um, uh, about paving and how much can happen. So it, it, it's a complicated, messy situation. And I just want to acknowledge all the work that goes into this. Um, and I also want to encourage us to stop thinking about just us. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Paul? Um, go for it, has hand up, but I'll, I'll speak since you called on me. Um, so yes, we did do this pavement management plan. Jason Skills did a terrific job and we actually and that's on our website. We've actually packaged up his presentation and the council's response to that is a little video that people can watch. And the, and the council, the TSO committee has asked to have that done again, which we will update so we, people can do that. The other question that Lynn has raised with me, which I haven't heard her raise tonight, is um, Guilford for state numbered roads, we maintain some of them, some, some of them the state maintains. And how is that differentiated? And can we have the state maintain all the state numbered roads? Um, so if you want to petition the state to take over all the state number of roads, you can. It's a process of petitioning the state. They have to decide. <clears throat> so that, that would be um, 116 all the way from the notch to back to um, Hadley. And it'd be Route 9 from South Pleasant Street all the way to Belchtown Road. I mean, Belchtown. Those are the those are the only two that um, state routes that aren't main sections that aren't maintained by the state. Did, what about sixty three? Does state do all of sixty three? State does all of sixty three. I, I, Paul, thank you for bringing it up. You know, in find in realizing that half of Route Nine in Amherst is state owned and half is town owned. And what I've been able to gather is at some point the town said, okay, we'll take it over. I mean, I'm sorry to say, but why are we maintaining a state highway? A state so, road, excuse me. So based on your community size, the state um, gave communities the ability to maintain the roadways in, in their central area. And this was done quite a while ago. 
So that's why we have a section of Route 9, and that's why we have a section, we had a section, just one section of 116. Um, 15, 16 years ago, 17 years ago, the town asked to get another section of 116. So we, uh, the, the town physically asked for that because they didn't like the, they didn't like the standard mass DOT road design at that time. Um, so they asked to get that section. It was the section from Snell Street to Country Corner. That used to be state maintained when I first got here. But then the center part, the little section from Snell Street to um, the center of town and, and Route 9 from the center of town, the Belchertown Road, that was decided a long time ago based, based on the size of the community. Um, Northampton, they maintain Route 9 through the center of Northampton. They maintain part of, maintain part of 5 and they maintain paying part of 10 as well. So it depends on the size of your community, whether you were given this, given this task, I guess. Hadley, they don't maintain anything, any number. Well, they actually do. They maintain 47, um, but they don't maintain Route 9. So it's, I don't know why, how it came about. But if I could plug Bernie, since I'm talking, <laughs> Bernie's right. Um, there's all these little programs that all these people make. We, there's complete street program. There's safe routes to school program. There's all these little programs that there's money for road repair in, but you have to compete for it. The state says we're going to put more money in the paving, but they make these programs you compete for. So to compete for uh, money, you have to go hire an engineer or have some somebody take time to design something so you can go compete. And then you stand there at your competition like you're in grade school saying, please select my project. And they select it or they don't select it. If they actually take all the money they put into these little, these little niche programs, which the majority of these little programs, it's the bigger communities who can afford to apply for them and win stuff and get the money. So it only benefits a small number of large communities. But if you took all this money and you put it into the chapter 90 formula, which the chapter 90 formula is based on population, which includes part of UMass's population. It also includes, um, it also includes um, income, which we have a lower income because it includes part of the UMass population. And then it includes road mileage. So chapter 90, when chapter 90 was invented, it was the coolest, slickest, best way to equally pass around money. But then they started adding all these little projects, all these little programs on, which siphoned off money. If we could get our legislators to come forward and say, stop all this, put it all in Chapter 90 and divvy it, divvy it up on the Chapter 90 formula, we would get more money based on our population. And it would benefit every community in the Commonwealth. And the smaller communities would jump on the bandwagon with us. And it'd be the all the little Goliath, all the little Davids fighting the big Goliaths, which are really only about four or five communities in the state. Um, so that would be the way to push for more money, in my opinion. And since I this kind of is just a piggyback on what Bernie said. Sorry. I was okay. doing that. You want me to keep going, Andy, with other questions? Or yes. you want to stay on roads? All right. Um, but... Paul, do you got something else? Okay. Um, all right, so what are we switching to? Do you have any updates on the uh, phase two stormwater program that, and how it may impact town expenses in the future? So right now we're still on the gathering information part of the phase two program. Uh, we don't foresee that we'll have any real big capital projects unless we decide we're not going to be required to do any really big capital projects unless we decide ourselves to do one uh -huh. so that's where this is kind of going right now so we probably have four to five years maybe six before we actually will be seeing larger projects that are coming out of the data collection and the problem identification that we're doing now uh, do you anticipate that utility costs will continue to rise and, and impact your operating budgets Yes. Yes. <laughs> Even um, I could answer that question. <laughs> it's a question. I'm just throwing them and asking. Um, we're not judging the questions. Uh, so this one, you um, you sort of said depends on the request, but maybe you can just give a quick overview for resident work requests, um, an overview of 
uh, maybe the range of how much time is devoted to responding to those requests? It definitely depends on the request. Uh, pothole requests, we spend a lot of time on. Um, and we really appreciate people calling them in. Um, someone questioned why we just based our list on people calling things in, but people calling in helps us because we don't really have the staff right now to go around and patrol. Um, we've been, we haven't been patrolling as much the last year or two because of not having enough people. Um, but, but we take those lists and they get put into a prioritization and they get done. There are some pothole requests that get put on a bigger list, which is part of the paving list, the maintenance list. Um, people who call those potholes and get frustrated with us because we didn't come patch their pothole, but we come and we do a bigger repair job. Um, tree requests, tree requests are handled pretty quickly. The problem is though, there's not enough um, resources to prune everybody's tree. If you think it needs to be pruned, um, yeah, so it'll get put on the list of pruning, um, which will probably is a very long list and that is not a priority. If your tree is dying and is dropping a lot of big limbs and looks like it needs to come down and Alan Snow goes through his process, it's a, a very formal process of identifying how to take, which trees to take down um, and he'll take the tree down. We also, some of those tree requests get put in the list, which actually Eversource does for us. Eversource is, we can't work near wires. That's not in our job. It's not in our, it's not in our ability. We're not supposed to work close to wires. So Eversource has tree crews. They come in and they work really close to the wires and they take care of those for us. Um, those usually take a little longer to be taken care of. And some people get a little upset because that takes a little longer too. But we do use Eversource as well. So that those requests are taken care of. Requests for things like stop signs and traffic calming and we want a speed limit. Those things, those requests come in and we look at them and we try to figure out how to address them. But many times those are the ones that sit on the back burner and keep going around and around in a circle as we try to address them and figure out what to do. So the really the things that really need attention right away. Um, dead animal or our special package service we call it where we pick up packages <laughs> on the side of the road uh, those get taken care of pretty quickly um, so there are some things that are like really quick things that get done and other things take a little while and okay um so a question about personnel services uh it increased significantly due to step increases cost of living adjustments um, and new collective bargaining agreement and the question was about highway went up 11%, street and traffic lights was 17%, and what level uh, do you anticipate in future budgets? And I'll just note, Gilford and I took a closer look at this today. The, the street and traffic lights going up 17% was due to a position reclassification um, to make the position more competitive and more aligned with uh, what that type of position gets paid in the private sector. Um, so that increase was a little larger than other ones, but that's a one-time thing to, to reestablish that position. Um, but in general, um, Guilford, do you anticipate, I assume we anticipate wages um, will continue to rise? Yes, we do. We still have two groups of people or two sections of the association that we're working with as part of the collective bargaining agreement that was signed. And we expect some some increases there as well. But um, there, there will be there will be wages going up. Uh, you talked about snow and ice removal a little bit already. Um, the timing of the central fire station electrical service uh, upgrade replacement. Um, any update on that? So when we ordered it, we were told 12 to 18 months. Um, they called to check on it a few months ago. They were told 12 to 18 months. Um, we expect it to just mysteriously arrive one day, like the last one we ordered did, but the last one we ordered actually did show up about 14 months after we ordered it. Um, but once once it shows up, we've worked out how to do it with Eversource and it'll be a little project for the fire station building um, unless we build a, another building faster. All right, keep going. Uh, you've spoken about this in the past, but can you talk about the potential, at least in the future, to replace some of your 
gasoline or diesel burning vehicles with um, either hybrid or fully electric options. Yeah, we still look. We still look at this, and we actually have a vendor who sells landscaping equipment. Landscaping equipment seems to be the the area that's having the biggest changes in electric electrical use. Um, I think mostly because they come do a small thing and then they pack up and leave, but then they can recharge as they're traveling. Um, so we're seeing we're seeing some some advances there. And Alan Snow, the tree warden and tree and grounds division director, wants to try some. And we've actually bought some for the uh, dog park. Mm -hmm. We have some electrical uh, mower, we have electrical mower and some electrical equipment there. Um, we're also looking at putting in a solar panel on the building there to charge the the equipment. So we're we're exploring it. The problem with um, trucks are you gotta if we're plowing snow, you can't stop for 20 minutes or an hour or eight hours to recharge a piece of equipment to go plow snow. Um, so that, that from that standpoint, we're not there yet. All right, um, tree and grounds maintenance. The town only has six cemetery plots remaining. And in previous budgets, the finance committee raised the issue or whether the town should continue to offer the service. Um, where do you see, what do you see coming down the road in terms of the town offering, offering these uh, services? Well, we do, need to, we do need to talk about what we want to do. Um, <clears throat> do we want to continue offering the service? Do we want to merge with another cemetery in town? Or do we want to buy land next to the North Cemetery to expand? There is the possibility. That's the only real possibility is to expand in the next to the North Cemetery. I do not, I do not think there's any real place to, to start a new cemetery. We, we have a hard enough time finding a DPW site. Um, but although the use is pretty quiet, so I imagine it might fit in next to a neighborhood somewhere. Um, <laughs> It's a peaceful place, a lot of reflection. <laughs> All right, that brings us to uh, explaining what a wood bank is. So uh, we cut down, we do cut down a lot of trees um, and most of the trees are ground up and made into wood chips and some are processed into compost, some are given to people, but a wood bank would take those larger diameter pieces of wood that we chip and bring them back to a central location probably someplace like Ruxton or some, maybe the transfer station. And then the wood would be available for homeowners in town who, who burn firewood or burn wood for heating to come and harvest it and take it away for, for us. Um, there's two basic methods. One, you just have a pile and it's a free for all. And the other method is, is that maybe you have a pile and you coordinate and someone in town cuts and stacks it and people just take it away for a, a nominal fee. Um, you do, they, you, they usually are offered to people who are on fixed incomes or qualify for housing assistance first. And then it's usually, then it usually goes to people who, um, other people. Uh -huh. And, and Gilford, I, I didn't, I didn't understand necessarily the context of that question. Is that something we currently offer or are you you're looking into? It, it's something the tree warden, Alan Snow would really like to do. He, he feels really bad about people not being able to use this resource and we just basically grind it up and turn it into mulch. Okay. Um, so something maybe to look into for the coming year. Um, so that brings us to the end of um, most of the general fund questions. I think the other ones we've discussed that I didn't bring up explicitly. Um, again, the general fund includes DPW administration, highway, snow and ice, um, tree and grounds, the um, the garage that manages all the equipment, um, and street and traffic lights. So if there's any other questions on general fund, um, now would be the time to ask. And then we'll be moving on to the water enterprise fund. I do have one overarching question, which may be for you, Sean. Um, it's the one department, of course, is a large department, but we don't normally divide our department budgets into sections. Is there a legal requirement we do it? Do we find there's an advantage to doing it? Or are there disadvantages to doing it? Um, well, so 
there's no legal within the general fund. There's no legal reason we have to separate the DPW the way we do. Um, I think it's more operational. That's how the work has been divvied up in each of those areas has sort of the, their own supervision and leadership um, within each of those areas, uh, division leaders. So I think it's generally the way we've chosen to to set up ourselves. Go for you, you know, weigh in if you've got more historical context on that. But um, there's no legal reason we set it up that way. Yeah, it's, except it's except for maybe except for snow and ice. Sorry, so, snow and ice is the one, the one area where you generally separate it out because you're that's one of the few things you're allowed to legally overspend, um, overspend the budget and make it up on the the tax rate the next year. Sorry, go ahead, cover. No, it's okay. Um, it, it it is basically to allocate how much one group has to spend, and so we don't go too crazy and spend everything on something else, and then we don't have any money for tree and grounds or recreation. So it's just been set up that way to give us guidelines. And we kind of work in those guidelines. And it also allows us to <clears throat> keep track of how much like electricity is tracked in tree and grounds and highway or tree and grounds and admin. And then the enterprise fund. So it allows us to track which areas are using the most electricity or stuff like that. So it it does help us keep track of expenses per uh, functional area and for individual places. Yeah, and, and Public Works is a little bit unique in that it does a lot of different things. Uh, many of the other departments sort of have its, you know, its narrow um, role um, where DPW does, you know, snow removal, paving, managing our parks, um, fixing vehicles, you know, you name it. Uh, they do a lot of it. So. Um, so again, we don't have to do it that way, but generally that's, it's from a, for an organize, organizational uh, benefit. Okay. And then the enterprise funds, the enterprise funds, obviously those we set up um, yeah. because they have a, a revenue source that we can dedicate to it and um, track that revenue versus the expenses associated with it. So let me ask a general question of the group, and that is, are there other questions about the general fund sections of the DPW budget? that you want to ask. Are there any questions about the capital, uh, the CIP portion? Bob. Yeah, Guilford, I'd like to ask you, uh, what, what keeps you up at night? You know, what are you worried about the most in terms of the, 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 the infrastructure in the town? So if, if I... I have to actually just go blank when I come home or try to go blank or else I don't go to sleep and I go crazy. Um, I have, I have newer, I have a lot of newer division directors with me right now. Um, some of those, if you ask them that question, they could just rattle it right off because they haven't compartmentalized it yet, I guess is the way I, they call it. But we do have aging infrastructure. It's all over town. It's all over the United States. Um, we had a sewer break Saturday night. Um, the, it was a collapse on. So, oh, well, it was a, a collapse. His, on mind, his, his, his mind went blank. <laughs> <laughs> South Whitney Street. Um, yeah, it, it was on North Whitney is where the actual collapse was, but it blocked up a, a line and we had to come in and take care of it. Um, we have several of those around. Some are worse than others. Um, we're putting together programs for it. Um, we're going to spend money on it. We we do know we need to do it. It's just a matter of getting there and doing it. Um, but there's there's things like that. There's <clears throat> um, Caracas working on North Northampton Road. They hit an old they they were working over an older water line, and because they had a really big piece of equipment vibrating that water line, they blew out a fire service for Amherst College. Um, those things just happen, but because it's older, it probably happened more than it would have if it was a newer line. Um, so there's lots of things that can happen. The thing that bothers me the most, to tell the truth, is people just ignoring rules. Um, and I, if if people would just follow the road rules, the rules of the road, our lives would be so much easier in DPW. Drive the speed limit. Don't do the left-hand turn when the light turns green. 
Don't sneak through the intersection. Don't turn right from the left hand side. Just those are the things that drive us crazy the most because people then make requests to us to say, solve this problem, make these people stop doing this. And to tell the truth, I can't stop these people from doing it. There's nothing we can physically do to the road to make people stop not obeying the rules. Um, so that's the that's actually the biggest one that bothers me. I'm glad you asked that because I got I, I popped into my head. Hope it doesn't keep you up tonight. <laughs> uh, so uh, if uh, there's nothing more that somebody wants to ask on any of the areas we've identified, I think it's worth going into the enterprise funds. Okay. Um, so same thing we've had, uh, Bob, thank you for sending in many of the questions. Um, so I'll just dive into those. We have a few for water. Uh, the Centennial Water Treatment Plant is a large construction project and will need close monitoring. Do we have the resources to adequ adequately do that, um, especially given how tight the DPW budget is? Yes, we do. Um, in the in the project for building Centennial, we built in a, a funds to actually hire an outside engineer to be the resident engineer and to be an on-site supervisor. Um, we were expecting to have more staff available to be there at the plant, but we hopefully will hopefully we'll have enough staff by the time the plant gets ready to start up to learn how to run it. Um, but we did. We we put the money in the budget, and it's there's a contract that's. Uh, got to be signed and then they'll be doing that um side note we had the we had the pre-construction meeting with the contractor this week or excuse me last week it went really well um our rh white is the contractor they're really excited to get going uh, we have a couple little things we have to do um, we have to have a pre-construction meeting with pelham and we have to do some other stuff but we're getting ready to start the project and then probably before the summer's out, we'll see people up there doing demolition. Um, a related question, actually, while you're on that subject, um, and this is partly but something I noticed when I was reading the budget book uh, and about the intake reservoir needing dredging. Is there a lot of maintenance of the uh, whole system in Pelham that is sort of fallen by the wayside because we haven't been using water from the system no no we're, we're we're required to do a lot of we're required by our permit to do a lot of the maintenance and we do it constantly um so we pretty much have kept such things going we actually do just need to we we do need to do the dredging of the intake reservoir which is something we've kind of put off until we get closer into the plant being finished um but we'll get to that. But all the other reservoir and all the other watershed issues up there we've been taking care of. John, back to you. Um, so this one, you may, uh, one letter makes a big difference. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no, no, it's all right. Um, so it, we completed a leak detection survey of the entire distribution system, not lead detection, but leak detection. Um, and Ooh. do you... Do you know the results of the uh, leak detection survey? And were there any water lines that needed urgent repair? We do a leak detection every two to three years. So it's not one thing we do and walk away from, but it, you'll see in the capital, we pretty much schedule it in all two to three years. So the last one we had, we found a couple of leaks that were pretty large and they were repaired. Um, we've gotten to the Oh, well, the best leak we ever found, just to tell you, remember in front of the um, Southwest dorms, there's a big field next to University Drive that used to have like a wetland in there. Well, that was a broken water line. Um, mm -hmm. And we brought the leak detection guy in and we took him on UMass campus and found it for him. And then they fixed it. But um, we, we do we leak detection a lot. Um, yeah. uh, next. Um... What potential new sources of drinking water exist in town? So uh, we completed a study back in 2016, 2017 of what we needed to do to build resiliency in our system. And the, the study came back with we need to maintain this, maintain the sources we have. We need to get Centennial back online. We need to automate baby, uh, baby carriage. And then we need to look for a source that's in the western part of the community. So we're working on getting Centennial back online. 
baby carriage has been automated. We actually run baby carriage for the last last three or four years. We've run baby carriage 20, um, almost 24-7, um, where it used to be only a August, September, October facility. We now you run it pretty, pretty continuously. Um, so all those are in good shape. We are working with Hadley um, on a joint project that may, we hope comes to fruition, but they want to bring their Mount Warner wells back online. And then we've talked to them about that being a possible backup supply for the town of Amherst if we need to. Um, we have one interconnection right now with Hadley, um, but we would need to build a second interconnection with Hadley to use their water because they have a lower water system pressure than we have. So we have to boost their water to our pressure or else if we open the valve, we just drain into Hadley. But we're working, that's, we're, we're in pretty good shape. And we actually have more, we have more capacity than the actual state will allow us to withdraw at any one time. So we're sitting much better in several communities in the Commonwealth. So that's it for water enterprise fund questions, if there's other water enterprise fund questions. Okay. Yeah. I just, um, Guilford, you mentioned Hadley and their wells. Do they treat water the same way we do? So fluoridation or whatever we add to our water. So would there be any integration issues if it's their wells as a source? They don't fluoridate. So yeah, that's what I no... thought they did fluoridate, yeah. So when they when they take our water, they they have to tell people they're fluoridating. Okay. Thanks. Other water questions. We're on a, um, is there any water rate issue questions that people had from that you can recall that you wanted to ask about the water rate memo? <laughs> Um, I, I don't have any, unless I'm forgetting, I don't have any separate questions um, that weren't discussed during the... Yeah, I just the, didn't, uh, yeah. I didn't recall any leftover questions. We just sort of held it aside. So I thought it was duty bound to ask since we made a conscious decision to hold it aside. Uh -huh. You want to go on to sewer? Sure. All right, so sewer... Um... Same question, Guilford, about um, somebody to oversee the gravity belt thickener and represent the town and, and monitoring that project. We did the same thing. We actually put it into the project to have a, the engineer to give us a project engineer and an on-site engineer to work on the project. <clears throat> and that's how we would do it. Um, update on that project. We had the pre-bid meeting last week on that project. And we got <clears throat> several several good contractors who came, um, Waterline Industries, who's doing a water treatment plant in Deerfield. Um, we actually had R.H. White, who's doing our water plant. They came. So <clears throat> we had several good general contractors and several good uh, subcontractors come and walk around the plant and look at things. Bids will probably open in late June, maybe early July, and we should be at, having... In August, September, we should start be starting that project. And that's it for sewer. I'll just say, um, again, water, sewer, these two funds, you know, we provided the projected rates in the future. They're largely influenced by utility rates, uh, as somebody noted earlier, especially electricity. Um, that I believe between sewer and water, it's over two thirds or about two thirds of our total electricity consumption um, for the town. So as this past year rates really uh, skyrocketed we're looking to lock in some lower rates in the future um but yeah driven heavily by utility rates um and then the other thing is sludge we talked about sludge so we don't spend a lot of time on it but that's also driven by fuel uh fuel costs and how much waste is made and um we're seeing both of those on the rise as far as the electric rate question um the first council, there was several people who were asking the question, which I channeled for, which was uh, solar at Centennial and whether that's possible and uh, sort of uh, complicated answer, I guess, is the best way to put it. Um, the building is designed to take solar panels. 
So we could put solar panels on the on the building. The issue is is that the building's generation capability mm -hmm. of solar is not very large. So you would not be reducing your electrical load very much, but you you could do it. And that actually may be something we look into because um, we don't have any behind the meter solar currently where we actually take the, the electricity, which is more beneficial than the alternative where you send it back to the grid and you get a credit. Um, so even a small amount there, depending on, on what the arrangement is, could help um, if we could actually directly source that electricity. Um, and then I know you've talked about this and I think there were some permit issues, Gilbert, but looking at wastewater, um, it appears there could be space there for solar, but I know you've, you've looked at that and had some concerns. Yeah, at the wastewater facility, the only real place to put solar is on top of the building. Mm -hmm. um, the open space at the facility is meant for expansion. So if we need to expand the facility, that's what those spaces are for. Mm -hmm. Any other questions on water or sewer? Any um, grade related questions also? This is not a good thing, but I'm sure many of you have seen other communities are dealing with the same issue at Pittsfield, I think was one, it's my hometown, um, most recently that had some large, larger than what we're looking at increases to their rates. Okay. Um, Go on to solid waste. Yes. Uh, so the solid waste fund, uh, revenue from the solar array on the North landfill is being credited to the solid waste fund. Is this amount before or after the sale of electricity to the town? And is the 75,000 and FY24 going to stay steady over time? Um, so the, we bring in uh, the way we benefit from that solar array, there's a few different ways. So we get a net metering credit, which is a direct credit on the electricity bills. Um, it's one penny per kilowatt hour, and we allocate that to um, our electricity bills proportionally based on how much usage there is. So it's not a huge, that, that piece is not a huge revenue stream. It's maybe $30,000 a year um, benefit, but it's allocated proportionally directly to the electricity bill. The other uh, bigger piece of it is that um, we get about more than we were expecting, about $120,000 per year um, in terms uh, in a direct payment. And that direct payment is broken up across, um, into three different buckets. So part of it is property taxes that the company pays for um, the, the, the land. And uh, that is like any other property tax revenue that goes into the general fund that doesn't go to the solid waste fund. Um, there is a, a pilot payment that's for the equipment, a payment in lieu of taxes for the equipment. Same thing that goes into our, our sort of property tax bucket doesn't go um, to solid waste. And so, and those two things are dictated by, um, those two things are set. They're based on our tax rate or based on the agreement. Um, and so the balance um, of what they owe us is what goes into the solid waste fund. And so that was the number that was about $75,000, $80,000. Um, and it will get a little bit lower over time as our property tax rate rises um, or the property tax bill goes up a little bit each year. It's not, it's not gonna rise a lot, but if it, as it rises a little bit, um, that payment that goes into the solid waste fund will shrink a little bit. The total payment will stay the same. They're, they're gonna pay us the same total amount of money um, more or less for the life of the, of the agreement we have with them. Uh, but the amount that goes into the solid waste fund will slowly decrease and the amount that goes into the general fund will slowly increase. Um, but again, it's that's been hugely beneficial for the, the solid waste fund um, going forward because that fund has really struggled for many years and this will um, definitely give it a lifeline for a while. And any other questions on that piece? Uh, the next piece is about entrance fees. And please confirm if the revenue from the sale of the transfer station stickers um, Oh, sorry. Is an entrance fee the, the revenue from the sale of transfer station stickers? It's not, is it? Or is that the... No, the, the, the entrance fee is from the transfer station stickers. It is, okay. Um, and then explain how the proposed trash hauling bylaw would affect entrance fees and the solid waste fund in general. I'm not really sure. Um, we do know that we're going to have to keep the transfer station open. Um, unless we find a hauler who comes in the town and is willing to do curbside everything, 
we we get a lot of construction and demolition debris at the transfer station. We could stop taking that and send it to um, Northampton. We also get a lot of mattresses. Mattresses are actually a really big product for us, um, mostly in the next two weeks and around Christmas time before Christmas. Um, those are mattress donation times, I guess you call it. So that somehow we got to, somehow the transfer station has got to stay open for some of these special ways we have because of who we are. Um, so we are not really sure um, how the entrance fee would change. I mean, <clears throat> there's a possibility the entrance fee could get added onto the, onto the cost of the entire system that we put in place. And then everyone can just come and just pay for their disposal, what they bring. So those are things that I'm putting together as I put together the RFI and um early putting together the RFI I'm behind on that so okay so that that was it for questions um for solid wastes uh, any other solid waste questions I guess that uh you're saying something a little bit different than I had assumed because uh certainly from the TSO side we've been hearing a lot of comments from people the segment that uses the transfer station that would like to have that option remaining available. I think that's generally been what the uh, discussion has been running in that direction. And I was sort of surprised that you said something as strongly as you did about RFI looking at not continuing. There's Yes. I mean, we know people would like it, but to tell the truth, if we're going to provide curbside service to everybody, there's no reason to keep the transfer station open except for this these special waste we have. So then we really have to look at what we actually do with the transfer station. People make the question, the decision in part based upon cost to them and cost to us, those of us who use the transfer station. It's a lot less than the cost of the current pickup, and we assume that that would still be true. Maybe not quite as big a difference, but still be true. Uh, Bernie? Yeah, we're, whatever gets decided, we're going to have to, I think, give people some either clear opportunity or clear instructions on how you get rid of the mattress, how you get rid of the excess uh, dining room chair, uh, how you get rid of the, the the skid that came in with your uh, your wood pellets. Uh, if we don't accommodate for that, we're gonna find those things in wooded areas. And, uh, <laughs> you, you know, that's just an unfortunate fact of, unfortunate fact of life. And so it, it does, uh, it does make life a little more complicated. Do you want me to go on to the last enterprise fund, Andy? Yeah, because I think this is really a discussion for a different place beyond mm -hmm. what we just had. So the last one is our transportation fund. And there was just one question about um, developing a plan for replacing on-street meters. What is the financial benefit of replacing the on-street meters? Um, is it mainly reduced labor, um, double sale of overlap parking time, or some combination thereof? Um, uh, Guilford, if you want to start, I can add on as well around converting the single meters to the kiosks. Yes. So um, <clears throat> with the desire for people to use credit cards, um, you're kind of phasing out single use meters without having to have, I mean, you're phasing out single use meters. The single use meters we have now cannot take credit cards. So if we want to stay with single use meters, you have to buy new, on completely new meters. So no matter what you what you want to do, if you stay with credit cards, you're getting new meters. Um, every single space meter or most of the single space meters, you do two spaces at once. They have to have their own connection to the internet to work and take credit cards. So there's a fee for every one of those meters. Where if you use a kiosk system, system, each kiosk has a fee for using a credit card system. Which, so if you have 200 single space meters, you're paying 200 times the fee. If you have 30 
kiosk that you're paying 30 times the fee. So we're actually going to probably definitely move away from single space meters and have to go to, to kiosk if we want to continue the credit cards. Yeah. And the other reasons are when we've looked at this, it, it cleans up the streetscape quite a bit as, as you can pull out all those, you know, uh, cut throughs the into the sidewalk. If we can just have one kiosk, it's usually for 10 to 15 spots or something like that for every kiosk. Um, it definitely cleans up the streetscape and it also gives us better data on utilization of parking. Um, right now we have three or four different ways you can pay um, for parking and the on-street meters, we don't get any data from that where we can get data from the kiosks and from our um, from the app, uh, but you can't get much from the on-street meters. And it also, I think somebody referenced, it does save on labor having um, right now, every Thursday, we have to go around with a big bag and um, <laughs> collect all the, uh, all the yeah. coins. And um, yeah, it's a time consuming process. The bank will probably, yeah. well, the bank may not appreciate it. I don't know, but um, yeah. Any other transportation fund questions? Um, the transportation fund is doing a little bit better. Um, it hasn't, it's not uh, spiking back to where it was pre pandemic, but it's doing a little bit better than last year. Um, we have seen uh, the intended um, effects of increasing the permit rates. We, you know, we increase the permit rates uh, and that's a, a three year transition. So they'll go up again for next year for um, based on the schedule that's in the, the new permit regulations. Um, but we have seen that revenue number go up uh, in, in the magnitude of what we were expecting. So that was good. Um, we're thinking of some additional parking changes that we might bring back to you um, sometime this summer um, related to ways to maybe increase some parking, uh, looking at parking rates and so on, enforcement hours. Um, we'll try to bundle those things that we think would improve the system. Again, looking looking to the report that we got several years ago on ways to, to strengthen our parking system. Um, and I think that's it for transportation. Hey, uh, I, 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 I want to just raise one issue that I've noted, and that is there's a parking lot at the station road end of the rail trail, and that gets overused on weekends. I mean, if people are parking on station road, it, it's really not adequate for the number of people who are, who are parking there. Um, is there any other place we could work out. I mean, I know like Amherst College has a parking lot right next to the trail. Uh, I don't know if we could work out some parking there on the weekends or something like that. But I mean, it's just obviously it's not something for this committee, but it's just I just want to put that out there that it's a it's it's a real problem. Um, and it, it won't, you know, it'll prevent people from getting access hmm. to the trail. Yeah, it's not it's not a it's not necessarily a transportation fund because we don't enforce or um, that I assume that's free parking, right? We, there's, there's, we don't yeah. charge for that parking. Um, maybe it's something Dave could take a look at, Paul, in terms of the use of that that trail. It's, if there's anything around that entrance, it's, go for it. It's a state. It's a state lot. Oh, it is okay. Yeah, yeah. No, no. I mean, I, I, I'm not suggesting that the town do anything to replace. To there's nothing you. I don't think you can do anything with the size of that lot. But I mean, it is, I just want to let people know it's a problem um, that there it's people are parking on station road because there's no more spots left. So, yeah, I've seen that with um, what's the one heading up into Belchertown or into Pelham, uh, the trail Amethyst, there. Amethyst yeah, yeah. So I've seen that as well there. Sometimes that gets jammed up and people start parking. But, you know, it's, sometimes it's, it's, it's the control, the use of the facility as well. So you, if you, and have endless parking, it'll be endless people. So in order to manage the number of people utilizing Amethyst in particular, but also for the, the bike path, um, I think that might be purposeful. Yeah. You'd have more parking if people didn't park there overnight. I'm just, unmuted. <laughs> I just wanted to say I live across from Amethyst Brook parking lot and there are several I'm pretty sure students who park there all night long, et cetera, on a regular basis. So it's an interesting, it doesn't bother me. They got to park somewhere, but it does take away during the day if, if they have not moved their cars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right now there's nothing that prohibits that, right, Paul, in terms of, yeah. 
any other questions on um, DPW or any of the enterprise funds? So I think the if we uh is there anything else people have because we should let Guilford go then since he's uh seems to be suffering it's I'm better now. <laughs> so looking to see if there are other questions that people have of Guilford while while he's with us and I appreciate all of your uh responses and wisdom today. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I don't know what's really wisdom, but we, we you like us to believe that it is though. I'm sure. Anyway, thank you. Uh, you're, so you're welcome. where we are is um uh, we're getting to the end. We have one uh more regular day which is um uh, gonna be Friday for uh, the community and development sections and uh, then we have those two leftover departments to take up um, a week from today and start to work on our recommendations so, so was... Andy Andy Friday will actually um, that's actually general government that's, that's right general yeah government. that one will <laughs> probably be a pretty busy um, just because there's so many departments and so many transitions between departments yeah. it seems Thank to take the most time um, so Friday will be pretty busy. I, I don't think I've got any questions. I don't know who's general government, but um, no, it's okay, Kathy. That's understandable. <laughs> we, no, hey, we don't, I, we don't I, need I, any. We can we can just we can give overviews of the departments. No, I, I did a on. I did a quick look, and I have a few, so I, okay. I will get you something. I'll, I'll get you. I'll get you some questions. Uh, hopefully tomorrow. Okay. Um, so general government on Friday, and then Tuesday is, is C and D, and we're, we've added um, we've added the fire department and DEI to that. Um, or sorry, no, DEI is Friday. We've added fire department and public health to the the Tuesday, the uh, May 23rd meeting. Um, yeah, there may not be much time after all those departments go to start the recommendation discussion, but there should be a little bit. So, and I was going to do on my, because I had schools as I'm, I'm starting to think about what it is that I might want to say about schools and to identify as I do that, but I think of the discussion points where uh, I can identify issues that the committee is really going to need to give some additional consideration to and uh, just sort of to get my mind working in the direction of where I, the section that I'm committed to writing. So I would encourage uh, you know, this, if your um, if your department's already presented, to give some thought thought to that, even if it's not presented, um, the thing about the you know as, as you're doing the questions, you're probably going to be also thinking about the issues, so that we can start moving in a direction. Uh, because what we will want to do when we get to the final um, discussion is to try and uh, identify the areas that need to be separately voted on and then uh, what we're going to say about the uh, recommendation as a whole and uh, I think that the uh, I can give the obvious example for the school which is the additional request from the school committee because uh, we had the same thing last year. Uh, so that's kind of where we're at. And I, I don't know if anybody has any questions or comments about the next stage of the process that you want to ask today. If not, I think everybody looks pretty exhausted and ready to. Uh... Do we want to vote a recommendation on water and sewer rates? We can't vote it today because um, it was not on the agenda. Okay. And, um, so uh, it's been added to the agenda for Friday so that it has 48 hours notice. And uh, Athena took care of that already. But I assume that it's going to be a pretty quick discussion. It may just be a motion and a vote for that matter. Uh, 
Anything else any, that anybody's not thought of that they want to raise? If not, uh, adjourn. I think we should adjourn. Yay. All right. Hey. Thank you. Welcome back, Abby. Thanks. Yeah. Bye.